todos. And welcome to our Feed Your Mind session hosted by the Houston Alpha Sigma Nu Alumni Club. I'm Andrea Cuervo Prados, and today you will feed not only your mind, but also your heart by learning from Rebecca Wilhart. I posted Rebecca's bio in the chat for you to discover more details about her work, passions, and contributions to inclusion and Ignatian education. I had the pleasure of meeting Rebecca in the ASN mentoring program, and each session revealed new and exciting facts and gifts about her. I hope you all enjoyed this session as much as I enjoyed each of our conversations. After Rebecca's presentation, we will have a 30 to 40 minute Q&A. And as you know, we receive great questions in advance. We will address those questions at the beginning of the Q&A. Likewise, you can type your questions in the Q&A section or click the raise hand icon to ask a spoken question. You will find more information about how to ask a question also in the chat. Rebecca is the author of five books and she generously will give five signed copies of her last book to five of you who fill out the feedback survey at the end of the event. I will send that survey to your emails and also post that link in the chat. Rebecca's last book name is Better Future, Communication and Leadership Lessons of This Slash Ability rights activists and advocates. Before moving forward, I want to thank Alpha Sigma Nu, Amy and Clara for their valuable support in making this event possible. And of course, many thanks to Rebecca for sharing her knowledge, kindness, books, and lunch time with all of us. Now, let's break down walls with Rebecca Wilhite in October. National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Rebecca, thank you again for being with us today and welcome to the stage. Oh, thank you. Uh, before I start to share my screen, I do wanna thank Alpha Sigma Nu for the generosity of hosting this event. Um, I am grateful for this opportunity during National Disability Employment Awareness Month. Andrea, it was a privilege and an honor to be your mentee during the Alpha Sigma Nu Mentorship Pilot Program. And um, I always want to acknowledge my mentor, Dr. Cunningham of Gonzaga University uh, for her dedication to me as a student and now as an adjunct faculty member. So thank you all for your commitment in my journey. So I'm gonna talk you through, I'm gonna share my screen and give me a second here. My presentation disappeared. That is not great. Give me a second. I am going to stop sharing my screen. Sometimes technology is so amazing and then sometimes it's like, wait, what just happened? And this happens to me in the classroom a lot. So thank you for your grace and patience as I reset up my, the sharing of my screen. I'd show from the beginning. All right. So this presentation is called Breaking Down Walls, Ignatian Pedagogy and the Disability Employment Opportunity. My goal today is to review the, a Jesuit education of Ignatian pedagogy, introduce the employment opportunity gap, talk about breaking down walls and Ignatian pedagogy in action, and then provide time for a question and answer and discussion. Just before we get started, I'd like everyone to take a few minutes just to think about your first paycheck. Do you remember that joy that you had during your first paycheck? Did you purchase something special? Do you have fond memories from your first job? So I'm gonna give you a little bit of reflection time on that first paycheck.
if memory serves, my first paycheck was um, I purchased the Tracy Chapman album on cassette tape. I'm aging myself here. And I played it in the not so fast car <laughs> that is in that photo, uh, a 1985 Volkswagen Golf. Um, and that is me getting loading up on my way from Oregon State in Corvallis, Oregon to drive to Anchorage, Alaska, my hometown. And that is a lovely photo of me as a child around the time that I was actually diagnosed with dyslexia. And I was diagnosed in kindergarten and I was transitioned to a self-contained classroom where everyone in my class, my fellow students received special education services. And we were taught how to read and write using the Slingerland method. In the third grade at around the age nine, we transitioned or we moved to a new neighborhood and I transitioned to a new school. And at that point I was mainstreamed into a general education class with no supports. I typically don't start presentations around my own experience with my disability, but I think it's important to understand my perspective and my passion for why this is such an important topic to me. In 2015, I was hired as a special programs employment specialist and I worked for eight years supporting students who experience a disability in their post-secondary goals. And this is my friend, Scott. And yes, he knows I'm sharing his photo. He's very generous with his time and knowledge with me. And he had a dream of working in a warehouse. And during my time with the uh, school district, I was able to find a warehouse where he was able to gain work skills and partnered with another student. It was phenomenal. He was able to get packages ready for shipping and just felt really included in that in a uh, warehouse. So that is my friend Scott. And it really brings to me um, the position that I had with the school district as a job coach moving forward. And I'd like to take a section time to think about language and how language matters. And I'll give you a minute or so to read this. What I see when I read this definition is really Ignatian pedagogy in action. It's care for the whole person. And another way to think about it as well is we're looking at every individual's preference, preferences, interests, needs, and strengths, often called pins. For some reason, every time I move a slide, it jumps two heads. So I apologize, I don't know what's happening, but. We're gonna take a look at um, the Ignatian pedagogy. And so we have um, this really fantastic quote around the Jesuit education stresses uh, um, development and the role of each individual as a member of the human community and thinking about care for the whole person is really, I think, reflective in this quote. It fosters a radical transformation, not only of the way in which we habitually think and act, but the very way in which we live in the world. And we're looking for that greater good. A Jesuit education is that of a full growth of the person which leads to action. And the Gonzaga experience, which is the university that I entered and learned around Ignatian pedagogy, is the commitment to dignity of the human person and social justice. Here I am on, in Spokane, Washington, uh, touring Gonzaga University as a student. And one of the things that's really resonated with me uh, with Ignatian pedagogy is that I never heard the word no. I had professors actually ask me open-ended questions. And I always heard some version of take your idea and build upon that. And so if you think about my time transitioning at the age of nine um, into a mainstream general education classroom, I don't feel that I really felt an academic home until my time as a Gonzaga student. And this was at the age of 49. And so I'm very proud of my time at Gonzaga because it was so empowering to me, 
when you are told for year for three years in graduate school some version on build upon that that is a that is such a foundation of empowerment and i always want to honor that when i'm thinking about ignatian pedagogy so here are the uh, all six items developing the role of each individual as a member of the human community action seeking the greater good commitment to dignity of the human person social justice and build upon that. So I wanna look at the employment opportunity gap. And if we're thinking about things through the lens of preference, interest, needs, and strengths, we're looking at the opportunity that is presented in that full whole body way, instead of focusing kind of on what could be perceived as um, negative language or different language, I really wanna look at it as this opportunity that we have to engage in the world with our Ignatian pedagogy. This is an interview from a student I did a couple of years ago, and um, he said, I'd like to get a job. I like working hard and I also want my future to get better. And that's really formed the uh, the title of my book is Better Future. And then during my mentorship, Andrea gave me this really amazing book uh, from Chris Lowney. And so when I saw this quote, it just really was, you know, full circle for me. Creating a better future, that's quite a task. How much difference can any one person make? Ask the heroes. And I think all of us here today, when we start looking at the breaking down walls, these are all heroic things that we can do in our lives to create a better future. So looking at the employment opportunity gap, the National Organization of Disability reported that over 60% of working age people with disabilities in the United States are not currently employed and would prefer to be employed. This is one of the largest underutilized employment talent pools in our country. Individuals with disabilities earn only 63 cents to the dollar as compared to people without. That is quite astonishing. That pay gap is nearly twice as much as the 20% gender pay gap. Up to 85% of individuals with autism are unemployed or underemployed. And I bring this statistic out because this is, again, one of the largest underutilized employment pools in the country. The Americans with Disabilities Act was signed in 1990 and includes a specifically a Title IV employment. Melissa Marshall is an attorney, she is a disability rights activist, and she refers to employment as the first, last, and hardest battle. So if you're thinking about that, uh, that first paycheck, that joy, this is, there's a lot of individuals who've not been able to get a first paycheck and have that joy of earning money that they get to go and buy their first album, or I guess now you download a playlist, but you know, that joy that you get from, and the feeling of accomplishment that you get from that very first paycheck. Employment has a variety of beneficial components and people with and without disabilities attach the same significance to work-related outcomes, such as job security, income, promotion opportunities, having an interesting job, and a job that contributes to society. So thinking about Ignatian pedagogy and how we can use what we learned in our education and break down walls and developing the role of each individual as a member of the human community. So the Jesuits believe that um, you can't motivate anyone to do a good job unless they have a good job to do. And so how can we break down those walls, those barriers to employment? And one thing you can do is volunteer to serve on hiring committees. If there's a panel to do some interviews, how could your voice, how could what you've learned today help you in identifying who's gonna be a great candidate? I You, you can mentor, you can, be part of a mentorship program. 
natural supports. I need natural supports. It's just a simple fact of my life that I need natural supports. And a couple of years ago, I was in a position where I had all sorts of things going on and I was role modeling for students. So I couldn't carry my cell phone with me to give me any reminders because I didn't want them on their phones. And so a natural support was one of my coworkers attached my calendar to hers just to make sure that if I, that I was always in the right place at the right time, because sometimes uh, when I'm get when I get so busy and I um, I just need that natural support where somebody is keeping an extra set of eyes on me. Super simple. Doesn't didn't cost her a dime. Didn't cost her a whole lot of time either. But for me, it was this really important that I knew I had a backup plan. And so um, you can mentor to help people learn um, communication tools, but you can also just very, open, you know, support your coworkers in a way that makes them feel dignified, respected, and have that backup support. So when we're thinking about seeking the greater good, you can always encourage your human resources to organize and provide inclusion training. You can coordinate with local disability advocacy groups and find out what's happening in your very own community and rever review all external communication for inclusive language. The um, APA, which is a writing style, they actually put out a um, manual on inclusive language it's phenomenal. It's free. You can download it and it, they update it regularly. And it's a really great resource just to make sure that you're staying on top of language as language changes. And there's the website there for anyone who's interested in downloading that, that document. I think commitment to dignity of the human person. One of the things that I think is really important is to just honor self-definition. Um, some individuals want to use person first language, others want to use identity first language, or no label at all. And I think just listening and being able to hear how people introduce themselves. I don't introduce myself as a dyslexic professor. <laughs> I'm just simply Becky. And so I, even though I have dyslexia, that's not the, the definition. That's not how I define myself. And so listening to how people define themselves and honoring that uh, self-definition. Reading memoirs and biographies by disability rights advocates and activists is a phenomenal way to get to know different experiences. I have a list of books that I could recommend. Judith Human has an amazing memoir that I read over and over and over again. Um, there's a book called Beauty as a Verb that looks at the history of disability rights activists through the lens of poetry and they have essays and poems, um, phenomenal, phenomenal way to access information and get to know what individuals' experiences are. And then reflect on your own communication style to ensure dialogue is collaborative and beneficial to relationship building. So how are you engaging with individuals and, in what, and how are you honoring that individual and their own dignity? Social justice, disability rights activism is civil rights and is social justice. In 1977, Section 504 sit-in was an extension of the civil rights movement. And the, Oregon, and the California representative said, what we did for civil rights in the 1960s, we forgot to do for people with disabilities. And this is Judith Human. Um, in the middle with Bradley Lomax and they are disability rights activists. And so even that twist, when you read Judith Human's book, even that twist where people don't, didn't know that disability rights was civil rights and is social justice, even that language can be profound for people to start to become more familiar with the history of disability rights activism. So social justice is competitive, integrative employment. 
Oregon, I live in Oregon, and we are the forefront of the country through in the 2012 uh, Lane versus Brown civil rights lawsuit. And what that did is it broke down structured workshops and it required that individuals with a disability receive competitive and integrative employment. For, for the first four or five years where I worked for the Salem uh, School District, I thought Lane versus Brown was Lane County, but it's actually this really amazing woman named Paula Lane. And um, she was able to go leave the structured workshop and get a competitive integrative employment uh, for the first time in her life. I believe she was in her 60s when this happened. And so um, Oregon is taking the lead on social justice as it relates to individuals with a disability. And so if you're wondering how your state could make changes, I would really recommend you look at um, the state of Oregon and the state of Washington for a lot of the work that they've led the way on. Support organizations that hire individuals who experience a disability. 92% of consumers felt more favorable towards companies who hire individuals with a disability and would prefer to give their businesses to those organizations. Become familiar with accommodations and advocate. The typical cost of an accommodation is $500. In the book, Beauty is a Verb, there's an engineer who um, needed an, an accommodation so that he could pull the train horn. And um, he went to the local Ace Hardware, cost, uh, Lowe's to, uh, to purchase some different things. The accommodation ended up costing around $2. And so that he was able to pull the train horn and fulfill his dream of being a train engineer. And so a lot, I think a lot of times people have this misconception that accommodations are very expensive when in actuality, they're not that expensive. They don't cost an organization a lot of money. And so becoming more familiar with that can help remove that barrier for an employer to hire an employee with a disability. And I think it's super important to advocate for uh, flexible work schedules, letting people work from home. We saw some changes with the uh, COVID pandemic that allowed more individuals to work for, from home and be equally as success, successful. And I think a continuation of that uh, for individuals who experience a disability is just an extra access point to employment. When we're thinking about the fifth item, it's action and elevating voices and authentic representation with your social media and platforms or curriculum. It's really important to me as an educator that my curriculum does reflect a variety of individuals. And so thinking about in what way can you take action to represent your organization as a whole um, I think it's really important to just be thinking about authentic representation as an action step. Listen and create a culture of listening. I'd like to tell a story um, and I have to just preface it by no saying, I don't know a whole lot because of confidentiality, but a friend of mine was a vocational rehabilitation counselor, often called a VRC. He had an individual working at a Safeway and this individual was really excellent at identifying patterns. This was his strength in that preference, interest, needs, and strengths. But he, so he recognized that during peak shopping hours, all of the shopping carts and the baskets were taken and individuals were coming in and just buying what they could carry. And he felt that if they bought a few more baskets and shopping carts, that the store would actually make more money because the shoppers could purchase more items. Well, he also experienced communication apprehension. So he practiced with his uh, vocational rehabilitation counselor what to say, how to say it to his manager, give him a little bit more confidence. And so he approached his manager and said, I'd really like to talk to you. Do you have a minute? And now that manager had two choices. He could say, I'm really busy right now. Um, I don't have time to listen or he could listen. And luckily the manager took the time and created that culture of listening and heard how the store could actually raise their revenue by buying a few more baskets and some grocery carts. And so I think taking that time to listen and 
creating that culture of listening is really, really valuable. Um, and so in this story, we're looking at the preferences of the individual and his strengths of finding uh, patterns, but equally his need to have some support in and around um, his communication apprehension. And to uh, acknowledge and honor self-definition, the sense that we have a choice in how we carry out our jobs. And I think that's really important um, and that that is an action step that we're thinking about how individuals engage in their job and they make it work for them. And that example of the train engineer, um, you know, he had a choice in how he was able to fill out that role and um, no one came along and said, well, you can't do it that way. So I think it's really important to have that also understand that that's very much an action step. And so the last thing I want to touch on before we go into discussion is the build upon that perspective, what I felt at my time at Gonzaga University. And um, what that looks like for me, breaking down walls, is really asking open-ended um, questions. And to think about open-ended questions, they're relationship building. Um, they help understand the context of the situation, and they allow for the dynamic of the relationship to grow. And something you can do that would be a very easy action step is to challenge yourself and say, I'm going to ask one open-ended question a day for 30 days and see how your communication enhances, improves. Does it change at all? Um, I really value being asked open-ended questions. For me, a yes, no question often makes me feel as though I haven't prepared enough. And, um, and so for me, those open-ended questions really allow me to, it, to navigate the world with my dyslexia um, in a way that's very profound and empowering. Working shoulder to shoulder is something that I need as an individual, but it's also something I did as a job coach. So let's say for an example, Andrea tells me, Becky, I need you to take in this dynamic where we're looking at each other through a screen. And she says, Becky, I need you to take your left hand and fold a piece of paper in half. And with uh, with your right hand, I need to have you grab a pen. I'm simplifying this, of course. <laughs> um, so what's happening is I'm having to stop and think, OK, left hand, what do I need to do? I'm having to process the instructions, but I'm also mirroring what she's asking me to do. So I'm seeing her left, but it's my right. And all of a sudden, my processing becomes far more complicated. So working shoulder to shoulder, I get to see in real time, take your left hand, fold the piece of paper, take your right hand and grab the pen. Um, and so for me, that removes one processing element is to work shoulder to shoulder. The second part that does is from a job coach perspective, a lot of individuals do experience communication apprehension and they work hard to avoid eye contact. And so when you're facing someone, there's an increased level of anxiety related to eye contact. So if you work shoulder to shoulder, you again have that opportunity to really just focus on the task and decrease someone's anxiety level. I had far more success as a job coach working shoulder to shoulder in, in any situation, in any task versus when I would work with an individual work face to face. And so it's really valuable to me to for me to just stop and think, okay, in what can I move my body to work shoulder to shoulder with someone um, really quickly? And that makes such a huge shift in um, task analysis, processing. There's so many benefits. Um, again, you could practice that a couple of times just to see if it works for you as well, or for the person that you're job coaching or working with, did, does that shoulder to shoulder enhance their processing abilities? While I was at Gonzaga and working on my master's artifact, I read this book around dyslexia and um, I realized I have narrative reasoning. It's a dyslexia type. And for the communication scholars here today, you wouldn't be surprised that one of my favorite communication theories is Narrative Paradigm by Walter Fisher. And so I connect to the world through storytelling. 
and stories are really important to me. They help explain the depth, the context, all of the different nuances that could be happening. And I've often felt that I want to tell a supervisor or someone a story because I'm developing, I'm wanting you to see my thought process where oftentimes other people are far more want direct communication. And so then conflict arises. So something I've had to learn to do is to be, to ask someone, do you have a minute? <laughs> are you deep in thought? Be and so then I can circle back with them at a later time so that I can honor my communication style, but equally honor all of the things that they uh, have on their to-do lists. And so for me, these are really three um, action items that allow any relationship to build and to grow and is a continuation of what I felt at Gonzaga University with that Ignatian pedagogy in action. That's how it kind of translated to me. Um, so those are the six things, six topics in which you could break down walls and help support individuals who experience a disability, uh, access their employment dreams and goals and access that very first paycheck. Um, I do wanna say that this time has been a gift for me to have through Alpha Sigma Nu and with Andrea. Andrea. And so if you have questions and you'd like to continue that conversation, please feel free to reach out at any time. Um, but I would like to open it up to questions and, I, um, and take any questions that you might have. I will say this is one of, I was at a conference for a transition, Oregon State Transition Conference, supporting students who experience a disability. And there we're, we were at a hotel in Eugene and that is 60,000 Ticonderoga number two pencils glued to a wall and I was in heaven. I, there's nothing better to me than a sharp pencil. So I had to have my picture taken next to the, the wall of pencils. So please let me know what your questions are. Thank you, Rebecca. And I coincide on the power of storytelling. Would you mind uh, stopping your presentation for us? Not a problem. Yes, I don't thank mind. Thank you. Beautiful. So thank you so much for all your insights. And as I mentioned before, I will start with the questions sent by other ASN members. I will open with an excellent question sent by Christian. He asked, how does the emphasis on reflection in Ignatian pedagogy contribute to fostering more inclusive communities for people of all abilities? And I would like to ask another question related to that one, and it's about the language of people of all abilities. Okay, so... Um... The, do you mind reading me the question again? Sure. Give me one second. I have it here. So he's asking, basically, how does the emphasis on reflection of in, in Ignatian pedagogy contribute to fostering more inclusive communities? He said he didn't use the word uh, disability. He said for people of all abilities. Okay. So the depth of Ignatian pedagogy and the reflection. Um, I think that's a really great question. And I think my initial thought to that, to answering that question was really um, putting on my teacher hat, my professor hat, and making sure that we are actively listening as well as reading memoirs. And there's this quote that um, I found during my time at Gonzaga that said something along the lines of, if you want to lead, you simply must read. And I just love the connection between reading memoirs and leadership. And so um, that is a way I think that we can access information and then turn it into action, um, especially for all individuals in our community. Um, and I, I, I also think just really asking lots of open-ended questions will help you learn what is needed in your community. Oregon is very different because we are on the forefront of 
civil rights as it relates to individuals with a disability, but we still have room to grow as far as employment outcomes. I worked with a lot of students over eight years who really want a job and doors just kept shutting for them. And so um, if you're looking at your community as a whole, thinking about active listening, open-ended questions, and really supporting on the employment side, really supporting organizations that hire individuals with a disability, visible uh, disabilities, invisible disabilities, um, use inclusive language in their uh, social media. You know, I think all of these things sort of wrap together kind of like a Rubik's cube to help create that community. Um, it's hard to say one single thing is going to to make a difference, but I think how we engage in our communities and where we go and what we do. Um, I also feel like um, serving on committees to have honest conversations about spaces. Um, my friend Scott uh, recently was able to purchase a hiking chair and that has opened his world to a lot of our parks and spaces. And so if you're thinking community, you know, just simple, it's not simple, but access to a park is huge. And so are there the ramps that are necessary? Are there trails that are accessible? And so, you know, thinking about all of those things together really start to create what community is. Um, so great question, but it, and I all would, I would say it's kind of a Rubik's cube. Lots of different things can be, um, can factor in how you build a community within your community. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, I just typed the second question in the chat, but I will read it. Natalia asked, how can employers be encouraged not to just talk about including people with disabilities, but actually hire them? Great question. Um, I think having, for employers to have flexible schedules is, is very huge. Um, for employers to have opportunities, for employees to have opportunities to work from home, um, I think is very valuable. Um, and being able to have that flexible schedule. So if you do have a medical appointment, you're not going to be at risk for losing your job. Um, so I think those two things are really valuable. Um, and, and to not just be, I think action really comes often comes down to how you vote with your dollar. And so thinking about, are you um, able to support organizations that have individuals who experience a disability? Um, what's their social media? What, what are their websites like? So being an informed consumer, I think is really Im impactful. Um, and, and being able to communicate to managers and say, you know, I like coming here because I feel like my community is represented when I shop here, you know, can be very empowering for a manager to hear we're making the right decisions. You're right. And now it's time for the spoken questions. Please raise your hand icon. <laughs> Click on the raise hand icon for me to see if you would like to open the microphone and ask a spoken question. In the meantime, I will see if we have any question in the Q&A. But I have another question for you. In the meantime, when someone is crafting his or her question, to do it in a spoken way. In your view, Rebecca, has artificial intelligence, and I will copy it and paste it here in the chat. Give me one second because I copied it, but now I need to read. Has artificial intelligence changed any aspect of education or pedagogy for individuals with dyslexia? What is your view there? I know there's this is a big topic, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> you know, I, I, I think I, I will be honest. I am not as knowledgeable about AI as I probably should be. I am excited about the opportunities that it does prevent for individuals who have communication apprehension, um, for individuals who um, experience dyslexia, such as myself, in which some, you know, 
reading, writing can be hard. Um, I think it's really important that AI can tap into all those various learning styles, um, such as having texts read aloud, <laughs> um, being able to critically think about uh, a maybe typing a paper and having AI scan it for before you turn it in, um, I, I think has a lot of value for, for individuals. I do, as an educator, I think I often worry too that um, AI would be used in a way to get out of assignments. And so um, that has a concern from me, but I think applications for individuals who have a learning disability in particular, it's really phenomenal. Um, and it really has a lot of applications that I'm excited to see how it can help individuals with, an, with a disability. And in part, I think as well that um, depending on your school district, you might have a learning disability, but not have the resources. So I grew up in Alaska during the heyday of the oil fields and our school district had funds to bring in experts in Slingerland and there was mandatory testing of everyone at the kindergarten level. So I was diagnosed really young and given those supports that I needed for K through tw um, K through two, but um, not every not every school district has that level of funding. And so I think AI can have some really great applications um, in that regard as well. I'm not as informed as I should be, but I do feel that there's a lot of applications that we just haven't had a chance to see yet that I think is gonna support a lot of people in trying to figure out how their brains think. And I, and you know, I, I love Gonzaga and I love my time there. And I think one of the big things is that they helped me learn how my brain learns. And I think that is so valuable. And so when AI can be applied to Ignatian pedagogy and individuals are walking away, having being more empowered, just as I was empowered, that's, I mean, to me, that's going to be phenomenal is it, and and so that would be very interesting to me to see how that can kind of all come together. Thank you, Rebecca. Amy, do you have any question? Allison, Caroline, D M C K I L L O P. <laughs> okay. I have another question for you. And reading the title of this presentation and reading the title of your last book, it caught my attention immediately the way that you wrote this slash ability. Mm -hmm. So I know you already talked about language in your presentation, but I would like you to elaborate more on that part and also to help us learn like better ways to express our words when we want to address someone with a specific, not, not with a specific, but with a disability. Um, Part of the issue is lack of knowledge. Yeah, and you know, I mean, I'm constantly learning, um, doing my research for my project, my master's artifact, I highlighted a baker who's in Boston and they are an activist, they're an advocate, they're an entrepreneur, but in all of my research, I never once found them refer to their disability ever and and i thought that's that's where we're headed she is an entrepreneur she's a baker she's a business owner she's an advocate and act activist um and she just goes by her first name and so i think part of it is having this awareness that um we as all uh, we need to let people lead in how they define themselves and so I wrote that chapter about the individual um, based off of their own definition, their own, the way they refer to themselves, which is their name. And so when thinking about disability with a slash, we're thinking about the person, their whole, and that reflects back to Ignatian pedagogy. Um, Kira Prasalis is care for the whole person. 
and we all have strengths and needs. We all have um, preferences, strengths, interests, and needs. And that's that. That's what makes us all very unique. Um, there's a great TED Talk by, um, called Danger of the Single Story. And I think when we're thinking about individuals, we don't want to label them with one story. We don't want to tell one story because we all navigate the world with multiple parts of ourselves, our strengths and our interests and our needs. And so um, I think when you're not sure what to do, the number one thing you can do is just listen. And that's a powerful statement. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions? I don't see written questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Any spoken question for Rebecca? Well, I also, ha I always have questions. <laughs> and that's part of Ignatian education, more than 12 years, probably. Uh, all my education has been Ignatian education, my bachelor's, my master's, my doctorate. So <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm always asking questions. I remember we talked about the strengths approach when we were doing this mentoring process. And now listening to you, I was wondering how those tests that we address at that point need to be adjusted or tailored for people with different abilities? Oh, that's a great question. Because, great... yeah, sorry. Because that, when I, when I read, I said, that was perfect for Rebecca because we focus on strengths. But then when you go and think of the process to reach out those strengths, that standardization of tests could be problematic or not. Yeah, you know, I think um, one thing to kind of think about in the context, um, and and I'm I'm sharing this from my perspective of learning. I had dyslexia in kindergarten, and I I think for a very very long time I've equated it to a very heavy backpack that I was constantly carrying this heavy backpack of this label that um, I was given, and that that came with some deficiencies. And I feel very fortunate that I have a husband who, when we play uh, dominoes and we need to do math, my husband does the math, whispers it in my ear because <laughs> I don't do math or I can pull out my phone now, which, you know, we didn't have when I was, at, we had phones, but they were attached to a wall um, and they didn't come with a calculator. And so um, I, I, that's really, I think sometimes we really, we need to be able to communicate to people what their strengths are, especially if they've been given a label, because I myself was focused for a very long time on what my label prevented me from doing, such as math, instead of thinking, wow, I am a, I am so creative and I am um, so hardworking and I can think out of the box and I'm a phenomenal photographer. Um, I have a hard time owning those things. And so when you're thinking about doing um, uh, skills, strength-based tests, it's sometimes hard to say, oh, I am good at that. And so that's where that mentorship piece, I think, is super important. And I'm really honored to have been part of the Alpha Sigma Nu piloting of the mentor program because it, it has that ability to help people see themselves in a way that they don't always, they haven't felt comfortable to own yet and so um you know if if in a situation where you feel like somebody's struggling a little bit maybe it's imposter syndrome maybe it's uh, a label they've been given um, but just reiterating what people's strengths are being that mirror to someone i think is really important to help them go oh i am good at that and then they can grow on that knowledge on their own so I, and I think you did a really lovely job of that um, during our time together is, is that mirroring language, um, you know, thinking about what I said, turning it around and making me feel like, oh, that was an empowerment statement. I didn't even realize it. <laughs> and 
as I told you, I learned that in my doctoral program at Creighton, again, Jesuit education, how to build on your strengths and not even think about the word weakness. Yeah. I don't see anyone with the race hand icon uh, active. So I, I still have time to ask you, to ask your view about a link that I don't know if you had time to see about dyslexic university. Oh yes, Richard Brent. Yeah, I recently read about that and immediately I thought about you. I said, I need to send this to Rebecca. I, I will not quiz you about that. I just want to hear your, your thoughts because they said that, and I have here a statement. That's why you see that I'm reading to the other screen. But they said that in today's AI driven world, there is a growing need for skills that are sometimes associated with dyslexic thinking. Right. What are those skills like problem solving, adaptability, resilience, communication, and creativity? However, traditional education and some workplaces are still focusing on the dyslexic challenges. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? on those dyslexic thinking abilities? Yeah, um, I I think as a whole, well, I guess I should speak for myself. I'm really creative. Our son is 19 when he went through the Lego stage. I can freehand any Lego thing possible. If you show me a photo of Luke Skywalker's x-wing fighter and a pile of legos give me an hour and i've got one built i didn't know i could do that <laughs> until i was 45 years old <laughs> 42 years old and so um we i you know i'm very creative and i can problem solve and i can push put p things together um really well and and i think that thinking outside the box how am i going to make this work um you know i had to work probably three to four times harder at college because I wasn't sure how my brain worked yet. And so all of that problem solving though was very effective. Um, learning, you know, problem solving. I can problem solve a whole lot of situations. Went for a hike the other day. I thought I remembered the trail, but I wasn't sure. So I just drug my foot at every intersection. <laughs> like, oh, turn around and come back. I'm like, yep, yeah, I know what I'm, you know. Um, because I know how to problem solve, I can immediately put stacks and pine cones at each intersection and I know I'm not going to get lost. Um, and that that's integrated into who I am and how I engage in the world. Um, and so I really, um, I'm excited that he's doing this. And one of the things that's really interesting is the book that I read that taught me that I have narrative reasoning. It talks about um, Richard Branson and he and all of the other individuals who experience dyslexia and how they are often entrepreneurs because we are thinking outside the box and we are looking at things like um, what can be accomplished here um, and, you know, and, and how can we, um, what's missing is often a question um, so that and then we're figuring out how do we solve what is missing. And so I'm excited that he's doing that. And also because um, you individuals like myself, when you're given a label, I think sometimes that's a heavy burden to carry. And the more people that talk about it and the more, the more they celebrate all of the wonderful ways and gifts and attributes, uh, I think more people are going to feel even more empowered. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions? Before we close, let me check the Q&A. Okay, Rebecca, thank you again for oh, joining us today. What a wonderful lunchtime session to feed our mind, heart, and soul. Gracias a todos. Happy Wednesday. I will leave the um, link for you to submit the feedback of this presentation and I hope you will receive your book, sign book soon. Bye.